Hi, everyone. Good morning. Happy Saturday. Um, welcome to our talk on what is a native plant, really, with Joan Pont from the CNPS. Super excited to have her back with us. Her classes are always so informative and so fun. Um, I learn a lot myself. In fact, I was telling Joan before the class that I've been personally inspired by people like her and her presentations in my own garden. And I ripped out about 20 ornamentals and planted about 30 native plants. Yes. <laughs> I'm on the biodiversity train and I'm super excited. And I hope you catch that fever too, because it's so fun. And so anyway, um, I do have a poll going on. If you could take a moment and pop over, there's some information that we wanna gather before the presentation. And I do wanna say that we have some fun upcoming classes go, uh, coming up. Uh, next week is gonna be Secret Season Gardening with Pam Pierce. If you don't know Pam Pierce, that's the woman that wrote the Golden Gate Gardening book which is essentially the Bible for edible gardening in the Bay Area. So she is an incredible resource. And she's going to talk about the secret season edible gardening, which is basically you can start now at, for a January, February harvest. So you don't have to shut down your edible garden for a few months. There's potential in these winter months, which is really fun. So that's going to be November 20th at 10 a.m. And then uh, Taylor will be here again, and he's going to do a talk on tillandsias, which are those indoor air plants that you see. You don't, they don't have soil. They're, um, they're also called tillandsias. So he's going to tell us a lot of how to care for them and whatnot. And so, and that will be December 4th. Oh my gosh, December. Um, wow. Anyway, it's December 4th at 10 a.m. So hope to have you join. Um, let me check the polls really quick before I turn it over to you, Joan. Let's see. Um, 79% have joined web, our webinar before. Um, we have 21% so have not, so welcome. Happy to have you here. Um, how did you hear about this class? Majority from the website. Um, what level of gardener do you consider yourself? 70% are inter intermediate, 18% are beginner. I like to call you baby gardeners, beginner <laughs> gardeners, baby gardeners. So excited to have you um, in advanced. I also love that people just want to geek out for an hour and like to join us for that. 12%. Um, it's always weird to look up the poll. Have you gardened with native plants before? 37% uh, said no, and they're looking to add. And then 62% yes, want to continue adding. And then uh, why are you interested in native plants? 79% said, uh, said all of the above and 30% was the next um, down and for drought tolerance, they're interested. Um, and then 26% attracting pollinators and 15% learning about indigenous plants. Do you think you could learn one botanical name in this talk? 87% said yes. <laughs> Yay, okay. 15% uh, no, I can never remember the botanical names. That's okay. We understand it's, a, you know, it's its own language, um, but you, know, you can always try. Like Joan said, what you have to hear something 75 times before it sinks in, so. All right, we'll just keep talking about them. All right, Joan, thank you so much. I'm gonna turn it over. I'm really looking forward to your presentation. If anyone has any questions, feel free to drop them into the Q&A and I'll kind of help filter through them. For Joan, we'll take some questions here and there during her presentation, but we're gonna reserve the majority of them for the end of the presentation. So thanks so much. Thank you, Joan.
Okay, so what is a native plant really? The term seems pretty self-evident, so people might be hesitant to ask the question, what really is a native plant? So that's what I'm gonna talk about here. How can you be so sure and what is so special about them? That's what I wish to cover. Come on, little slide. There we go. Here. So we live in California and it is the state in the shape of a sock. It has a natural border along the coast and it has a natural border along the Colorado River, but it also has these straight line political borders between California and Oregon, Nevada, and Mexico. So a plant living along the coast certainly has a natural barrier to expand, but if a coyote bush is planted right shy of the border, it can clearly fly a seed, because the seeds have those appendages to fly, over to um, Oregon, and there will be a continuation of a plant um, range within um, multiple states. So what was developed was something called the California Floristic Province. So it's no longer shaped like a sock. To me, it's shaped like a wiggly wine bottle turned upside down trying to get that last drip of red wine out for your dinner party. And it has natural borders all around it. It, also, it has the coast, a little bit of Southern Oregon, a little bit of Nevada around Lake Tahoe, and a little bit of the Northern part of Baja, California. It leaves out the high desert and the low desert to other floristic provinces, but it's a natural area where we have 3000 species of plants and 60% are endemic. So it behaves just like an island, like Hawaii or Galapagos. Islands are surrounded by water, the California Floristic Province is surrounded by water, mountain, and desert. The state has more species, 6,500 species, and a third endemic because of the washover on these political borders. So we have a summer dry climate, hot dry summers and cool wet winters. And because of this number of different species of plants and the number of plants which are endemic found nowhere else in the whole world, we are labeled as one of the 36 biologic hotspots in the entire world. So we should take care of our treasures. So was that California floristic province drawn arbitrarily or was it data-based? So I'm gonna take the range of just one plant, the toyon, spoiler alert, that may be on the quiz of your one scientific name that you're gonna be asked to learn. The scientific name is Heteromeles arbutifolia. And if you look at the range of the plant where it's found, it is very similar to that California floristic province. That doesn't mean every plant sticks to the boundaries of the flat, uh, California floristic province, but a lot do. The common name of uh, Heteromeles arbutifolia is Toyon, or Christmas berry, or California holly. Supposedly, uh, Hollywood is named after it. So this map came from a website called calscape.org. And it's a wonderful website talking about plants, um, native plants, and um, specific information about the plants so you can be more successful in planting them in your garden. For example, if they can tolerate frost and how big they get. So Latin names, scientific names, they're ridiculous. This one, heteromeles, hetero means other or different, like heterozygous. If you have one brown-eyed gene and one blue-eyed gene, you have brown eyes, brown eyes dominates. If you're homozygous, same gene, two blue-eyed genes, you have blue eyes. So hetero other, meles is apple. So those that do drink wine know about malolactate fermentation, Malic acid is the acid in apples. So heteromeles, so these little red berries reminded the person who gave the plant the name of a little apple. Our beautifolia is more of a stretch. The leaves reminded the namer of the um, beautiful arbutus tree. So heteromeles arbutifolia, toyon. So in the field, you don't have labels at the nursery or you don't have labels at a botanical garden. 
So those experts in the field are experts in a field called taxonomy. And characteristics of the plants, some you can see with your eyes, some you can see with a hand lens, and some you can see with a microscope, will help botanists identify plants in the field. And here is just a little sprinkling of the gorgeous flowers that are endemic to the, to the Bay Area. So the Pitkin marsh lily grows six feet tall and is fire engine red and stunningly beautiful. The Calcortis tiburonensis is like a fuzzy tulip-like lily. And it was discovered in Tiburon in 1971 by Robert West. And you can imagine how many houses were actually built in Tiburon before 1971. And this gorgeous flower was actually that recently discovered. It's amazing. So you don't need a PhD in, I'm wondering my images are slow to develop, but that's okay. You don't need a PhD in botany to um, get some help because of smartphones. We've got the California Native Plant Society, which was formed in the 1960s to educate people about native plants. You can load Seek by iNaturalist on your phone and take a picture of a plant and get its name. I'll talk more about calscape.org and calflora.org. They are similar, but not identical. Calscape is more geared towards landscaping and restoring California one garden at a time. Calflora is a compendium of all plants wild in California, be they native or escaped exotics um, and where they are. Picture this is a commercial project. I think it's $20 a year, but very good at taking pictures of plants and giving you the name. One book, and I'll mention some more books for specifics of methods of planting is the California Native Landscape by Greg Rubin. He's in San Diego and he's been landscaping with natives for decades and has really important information. And of course you can actually talk to a real human being at your Slope Garden Center which is more fun than looking at your phone all day. So when I use the word native, I think of concentric and ever smaller circles. So we have the state of California and we have the slightly elongated, but definitely smaller California floristic province. You have your own county. I'm now in Sonoma County. You've got your watershed and your plant community. Marin County has 17 plant communities. You might be in a redwood forest or a Douglas fir forest or an open oak woodland or chaparral. And you can learn more about communities, go on, on hikes with experts and um, just seeing them. They'll, these are plants that reproduce that are really happy together. And you have actually your home that has, did have native plants on it before bulldozers came and made a building pad and you can put some of those back. So the most extraordinary restoration project of native plants that I know about is what happened at Chrissy Field in San Francisco. So originally it was a wetland with some uphill, uphill lands that fed the wetland made for brackish water. So it had huge numbers of shellfish and was a bird stopover, migratory bird stopover. It was taken over by the military and actually used as a dumping ground, then an airfield, and it got restored back to a wetland. So what I read uh, was that people, uh, expert botanists, identified plants in the field, went back in the fall when the seeds were mature, collected the seeds, collected 10%, no more than 10% of the seeds of any one plant, the other 90% were to feed the birds or to propagate as they have been propagating. They would germinate those plants and then uh, plant them. 150,000 plants were planted and they kept the seeds specific to each individual watershed. So again, if they collected seeds of a coyote bush in one canyon, they would plant those seedlings back in that canyon and similarly in the next canyon. So not only were the species of plants um, restricted to that was there in Chrissy Field, but also the actual um, watersheds were specific. So it is um, thriving now. So I have a less ambitious restoration in my house. I have a spreadsheet and this only shows the A's 
Um, when I plant a new plant, I would write down genus, species, variety, cultivar, rootstock, let's say if it's an apple tree, um, common name, family name, and where it is. And um, this, every time you revisit the name of your plant and the spe uh, specifics about the plant, it's another opportunity to learn about them because you're only learning one scientific name today, and that's on the quiz at the end. So the sources are Sloat and other nurseries, uh, locally collected seeds like acorns and buckeyes. They don't take plants um, from the wild. They transplant really poorly. Um, CNPS has native plant sales largely in the fall. And learning what natives are actually still here and weeding around them and preserving them. So what's the distinction between native and non-native? So I use 1492. So 1491 and before, before European contact, new plants and animals would fly into California. They would come in across the Pacific or come in over the Sierra Nevadas or across the desert, but they would be introduced very slowly and very infrequently. But once they got here, they really liked it. And we had a huge amount of divergent evolution creating all those species that we talked about before. So it's just like Darwin's finches on Galapagos. So a breeding pair managed to get 600 miles offshore to the Galapagos, Galapagos Islands. Their offspring would populate the different islands and because the foods were different on those different islands, they eventually diverged to be 14 distinct species. But after 1492, there was accelerated introductions of plants. They weren't so infrequent. It was inundated. Um, there was accidental introductions. If you had a seed on your clothing or the animal, your cow that you were bringing over from Spain uh, would have seeds in its hooves and on its fur. So there was accidental introductions and there was purposeful introductions for ornamental plants and agricultural plants. Not every plant that was introduced becomes invasive, but some do rise to pest status and they multiply unchecked and cause actual extinction of native plants. So there are resources to learn about them. For example, UC Integrated Pest Management Program, UC a &R, University of California Agricultural and Natural Resources has a huge amount of information uh, available online and in books. So I'm not many people uh, were born before 1491 that are still around. So we, how do you know a plant was around before uh, European contact? Well, we have early documentation because California was so beautiful and so floristic. There was a golden age of plant discovery from 1750 to 1850, and people wrote down and collected what they saw. So we have. For example, David Douglas, um, your house is probably built out of two by fours that are Douglas fir, named after David Douglas, who was an intrepid plant um, explorer. John Muir wrote about California. And when he described the San Joaquin Valley before it became agricultural, it was green through September. They did not have golden hills in, um, in early April. And those bunch grasses stayed green all summer long. And my favorite is Alice Eastwood. She became head of botany at the California Academy of Sciences. So when the earthquake happened in 1906, she was wearing a long skirt and she collected as much of the famous herbarium as she could and ran down a burning staircase as the California original California Academy of Sciences burned to the ground and then was rebuilt in Golden Gate Park. There's other methods to find out what was there a long time ago. And one of the most interesting ones I read about was tearing apart with permission um, a brick from a Spanish mission. After all, how do you make an adobe brick? You get some adobe clay, you grab some plants that are within arm's reach, you mush them together, let them dry in the sun and stack them up. And they're labeled by year. There's 21 missions and they were first built in 1769. So if you break apart a brick and look at an electron micrograph of the pollen granules, you can identify plants 
and note the year that they were plentiful enough to be incorporated in a brick. So now alien plants, non-native plants, really have hit the grassland areas of California the most. So 80 to 90% of the grassland coverage is made up of non-native plants at this time. But not in your backyard, you can change that. The other story is um, white man's footsteps. So the indigenous population obviously were experts in field botany. They knew plants they could eat, they could use for clothing, and they could use for shelter. And when they saw a new plant, it was obvious to them. So this Plantago major from Europe seemed to follow where European settlers were marching around. And so they actually nicknamed it white man's footstep. We actually have plenty of native plantains and they are important larval food, foods for butterflies. Um, and I have no idea why the word plantain of this little tiny herb is the same as plantain the banana. They are completely unrelated. But that goes to how common names can be misleading. So that's our goal to learn one scientific name. I wonder which one that was. Oh yeah. So when you see a native plant community, you actually see a lot of cooperation, not domination. You have many, many species knit together and having many species gives you resiliency for weather extremes that we're gonna have. If you have a hillside with a hundred different species on it and something stressful happens, a frost, a um, extended drought and kills off 10% of the species of plants, you still have 90 left that's gonna cover the ground, provide pollen, nectar, fruit and seeds for birds and bees, erosion control, water retention, carbon sequestration, because plants do photosynthesis and take carbon out of the air, and it's everything that plants do, but they can buffet those, those storms. Whereas non-native plants exhibit enemy escape. I'm gonna give one single example, and that's of a plant called the common tansy. So the common tansy looks cute, but don't plant it. In Europe, some entomologists found 169 species of insects nibbling away at it. And those insects become nutritious bird food. I mean, birds can come to your bird feeder, but they really need insects for their protein. Um, those insects also provide control of the extent of the tansy. So basically they serve as little weeders. But here the plant is non-palatable to local insects and has become a noxious weed so much that it's on the hit list. This picture is from the Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board. But let's say you want that size shred in bright yellow flowers. Well, you can visit your slope nursery or you can visit calscape.org and put in advanced search and specify shrub, yellow flowering, et cetera, et cetera. I came up with golden fleece, Spiritomeria arborescence, which I actually just planted in my garden. You can see the range and I figure, oh, it's pretty, the natural range is pretty close to my house and give it a try. Um, there's many, many other species. Another example is the giant Coreopsis. The range is more towards Southern California. So since the California floristic province is so large, you need to watch for the Southern California plants that they're gonna be able to tolerate our occasional frosts, but they're gonna be super duper drought tolerant. Um, this plant is listed as living in areas with only seven inches of average annual rainfall. And when you have average annual rainfall listed, there is some years that are gonna have three inches and some years that are gonna have 14 inches. And that's with no supplemental water that's living in the wild. So that is one tough plant. So wait a minute, I feel some anxiety brewing. Do you really want, um, let's say you plant a locally native plant and 169 species of insects are nibbling at your plant in your garden. Do you really want that? I say, yes, you've got gardeners weeding away um, at your plant so you don't have the cacophony of weeds that I'm gonna have to deal with very, very soon. And yes, those little gardeners become bird food and you are reestablishing and maintaining the entire ecosystem before we inadvertently messed it up. 
Speaking of bird food, a little songbird lays eggs. And when they hatch, they are really vulnerable until they can fly. So a mom has been documented to make 500 trips in a day, bringing back caterpillars and other bugs to feed their um, nestlings. Dad made 200 trips, um, but who's counting? And these birds go from hatched to a new set of feathers and flight muscles and can fly in 14 days. That's their period of vulnerability getting so short. So we need a lot of insects to feed those baby birds. The other um, thing that non-native plants uh, can uh, be a negative for is the concept of the green desert. So something may look green to your eyes, but doesn't support the whole ecosystem. So to me, the really gorgeous um, structured Berkeley Rose Garden that was built as a um, depression era project to get people back to work and the abandoned garden next door, neither share um, support local insects and birds. And they didn't co-evolve with a local fauna that takes millions of years to, uh, to get that um, mutual symbiotic relationship going. So it's exciting to see world famous landscape architects like Raymond Jungles, he's on the East Coast, have landscapes that are mimicking nature with drifts of plants merging into each other and using native plants. And he has a new book out, which is called Beyond Wild, Gardens and Landscapes with, with this concept. But we have West Coast versions as well. We have Saxon Holt, and he has a, recreated his book um, called uh, Gardening in the Summer Climates, Summer Dry Climates. He's a photographer, a nature photographer, and a landscape photographer. This book is not 100% natives. He stated it was 40% natives, but lots of eye candy and lots of really wonderful information on gardening here. So we want to support our six-legged friends. And obviously, insects uh, help us directly by pollinate fruits and vegetables, um, but they are key to a healthy, sustained environment. Soil is broken up rocks, and that's the slow part of soil. These are geologic actions that break up rocks and give minerals to plants over hundreds of years. But the organic part of soil are dead plants, leaves, twigs, roots. And the insects chew them up, give lots of surface area for bacteria and fungi to do the final transition from a retired plant to fresh soil, either aerobically to compost or anaerobically to humus and to make a healthy soil. So we need that every single animal working together to sustain a healthy soil level, layer, layers. Coevolution is very slow um, and takes millennia to um, to have the plants and animals and fungi co-evolve to bring resilience and longevity so that they can tolerate um, changes in the environment. When you introduce a plant, you may see wild swings in population and actual extinction. So again, not every plant becomes a pest, but at least 3% do. So when I was a kid, I did learn about survival of the fittest and evolution. I was born after Darwin. And that always seemed to mean survival of the strongest. So for example, the great white shark is the top predator in the ocean and could eat every single fish in the ocean. But if they did, they would starve to death. So how do you balance that out? Well, you look at a salmon who can lay 10,000 eggs um, in one spawning and a great white shark has a few pups every other year. So they balance it out in numbers um, and have a sustainable agreement going on, even though the great white shark is the fittest. So plants exhibit the same sort of cooperation where you don't have monoculture, you don't have a thousand acre field of corn, which has one plant in it. So it flowers for one month of the year, no flowers for pollen and nectar for, birds and bees the other 11 months of the year. It fruits one month of the year, 
again, no food for the birds um, the other months of the year. And if a disease comes in, wipe out. Here you have polyculture. These are called tidy tips. These are so cute. This is in many, many uh, California native wildflower mixes. So you have multiple species working together. You have flowers, seeds, and fruit available all year long. And there was a recent paper from UC Santa Cruz talking about California having this stable environment. We did have ice ages, but it wasn't all glaciated for three to five million years, low extinction rate and lots of divergent evolution giving us our 60% endemicity, which is very cool. The other thing that can happen in a native garden is if you give it a backbone of native trees, trees, shrubs, trees, vines, grasses, you may see native plants pop up that you did not plant. Those seeds were in the seed bank just waiting for a chance to breathe. So in my Mill Valley garden, I actually saw the development of these beautiful little irises called Cicericium bellum, blue-eyed grass, and I did not plant them. So those seeds were in the seed bank and they just broke through and um, got a chance to, to shine. They're in the spring. They deal with the summer dry climate by drying up in late summer, hunkering down to their rhizomes because they are an iris and coming back the next spring. So they're really fun. On the other hand, there are weeds in your seed bank that will come up every year as well for decades. So you'll have plenty of work weeding. And weeds can blow in from your unenlightened neighbors until they catch on to the coolness of your garden. So you can start your journey. Here's a little oak seedling that's in the duff of a native willow. You can take a hike on and see the park at Tilden or see natural areas on Mount Tam, Mount Burdell, Mount Diablo, or see the um, San Francisco Botanical Garden, the native plant section there. And photograph what stops you in your tracks because of its beauty and mimic that in your garden. But start with an oak. Oaks are really important. They are keystone species. And in no time, ta-da, um, they support hundreds of species of birds and insects. So they're really important in the garden. Calscape.org lists 36 different species of oaks, and some are only little shrubs. So even if you have a normal sized garden, you can probably accommodate an oak. Get small plants or collect beautiful acorns and plant them and uh, start that um, species in your garden. The other great plant to consider are many members of the Arctostaphylus species, uh, genus. So these are relatives of Manzanita. This is Arctostaphylus sunset, which is a great garden plant. It's an evergreen shrub, has uh, flowers in the spring, um, late winter to spring, little berries the birds love, provides habitat and uh, uh, cover for birds. And once established, really requires no supplemental water at all. So those that check off drought tolerant on the initial poll, Arctostaphylus. Then you can go blue with Ceanothus, the other set of shrubs in the genus Ceanothus. They have stunning blue flowers. They get lighter and lighter to white and darker and darker to purple. They come in all sizes. So if you have a neighbor who has parked their past its prime RV right in your view, you can block it out with a ceanothus called a screening plant. So people plant peas and bees in their, uh, beans in their garden and know that they are nitrogen fixers. They have nodules in their roots with a symbiotic bacteria in those nodules that takes atmospheric nitrogen that is not available to plants and converts it to basically fertilizer, which is available to plants. But it turns out ceanothus is a nitrogen fixer also, has very large nodules and the bacteria in those nodules is called Frankia. So it's a nitrogen fixer. A lot of people think that the, a lot of plants that are available for um, in the trade uh, for California natives are really require full sun, but there are plenty of plants that live in the shade. Um, you've got a north side of your house that's gonna cast shade. Um, there's north sides of every hill that cast shades, and there's the understory of all the trees that we have that cast shade. 
So some to consider is the hookara. Hookara is, is coral bell. There's a rosette of leaves of the base and these pretty little flowers that uh, rise above it. And curiously, I've never seen a snail eat my hookara, which is cool. You can go to the Jurassic Park look with the Western sword fern, the polystichum uh, munitum, and it tolerates dry shade. And uh, the bunch grass, uh, a lot of bunch grasses can deal with huge amounts of sun, but one called Festuca californica is very, very happy under oak trees and is a really handsome grass. So you can use the native plant compendium for any style option that you, that you choose. Uh, the contemporary garden, the cottage garden, Southwest Mediterranean Japanese. I would hope that people veer away for the, from the uh, forever plastic garden. Um, I'm seeing a trend to go away from the term Mediterranean garden to the summer dry climate because the summer dry climate is on the west coast of all the continents, South Africa, Australia, California, oh, and the Mediterranean. Um, the earth turns this way. So the east coast gets all the hurricanes and the rain, and we're in a relative rain shadow. It's only in the winter time when the temperatures are cooler that we can get some backwash and get some storms off the Pacific. So wait a minute. If we're telling people when they garden with a native plant, they need to water it until established, maybe one summer, maybe two, how do they deal with it on Mount Tam? So it turns out there is natural irrigation. Here's an oak tree with very deep roots able to bring up water from lower levels and actually transmit it sideways to smaller plants, the toyon, heteromeles, arbutifolia, and the coyote bush, one of my favorite plants. Sages, which I would encourage replacing your lavender with. Lavender gets that bald spot in the middle after four years. Sages last a lot longer. And some of them are culinary and very interesting flavor and they're deer resistant. Buckwheats are another keystone plant um, supporting lots of insects. And sugar bush is rush, rush ovata shiny leaves, really, really beautiful plant. But these all have natural irrigation from your keystone species, your oak, which is pretty cool. What I've noticed is when I'm planting um, acorns and buckeyes, if I plant it just at the drip line of an established tree, those seedlings do much better and grow much better um, than if they're out in nowheresville. And I actually do not give any supplemental irrigation even that first summer, which is pretty amazing. So I have mentioned just a few native uh, plants, the toyon, the golden fleece, the blue-eyed grass, all the Arctostaphylus choices that you have, Ceanothus choices that you have, consider the oaks and the shade plants. But there are so many more that you can explore on your own that will be really fun for you. But we're gonna go to our quiz. And you thought I was gonna ask you to say the scientific name, but it's like Jeopardy, I'm gonna give you the answer first. So heteromeles arbutifolia. What is the common name for this evergreen shrub with red holly-like berries appearing at Christmas time? And one of the common names has five letters and starts with the letter T. And the answer is Toyon. So those of you that learned one scientific name, congratulations. And let's see if there's questions. Okay, well, that was super fun as always. And I learned a ton too. And thank you. The, I love how you present information because it's, it's a neat way of just sort of viewing sort of the whole picture. I do wanna encourage people to Joan has done several other talks for us, and we do have our recording recordings of all of our talks available on our website and on our YouTube. Um, and one, I think the last one you did was the um, making your garden nature compatible. And that kind of piggybacks off of a lot of what you're saying right now, which I think is a good, if you missed that, um, definitely review it. Like I said, She's oh, definitely been, a, huh? 
Oh, the other one was um, flowers every month of the year, January through December. That's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun to pull together. Um, yeah. And like I said, been a total inspiration to me personally. So I really appreciate that. Um, if you, a, a couple questions on like specific requirements. So, you know, clay soil or whatever. I mean, would you recommend Calscape being the best resource for that or probably a, you know, a, a nursery professional, mm -hmm. um, right. To help sort of narrow down the options. Right. So yes, the U S department of agriculture actually has uh, maps of soils. Even tiny San Francisco has many different soil types. Um, the most extremely stressful soil type for plants in the Bay Area is serpentine because it's toxic to most plants. Um, the Calicortis tuberonensis, the lily that was discovered in 1971, it actually grows on serpentine. So it's like, ha, I got my space and you can't move in. Nice. Um, so Calscape does uh, include the soil type that is um, tolerated or optimal. Yeah, I've been using Calscape a ton just with my designs, it's, it's so that advanced search is incredible. So poke around on that website. And what's also fun, a fun feature is that they generate, there's a design feature on it that you can go in and you can say your design aesthetic, and I, you can put in a few different components and it generates a design for you, a combination of different native plants. So, I mean, it, it's, that is an incredible resource if you're trying to sort of wrap your mind around a space. Um, I heard a talk by Doug Tallamy, and hopefully people will be able to hear him too. Mm -hmm. And um, he's on the East Coast. He's in Maryland. He says no other state has anything like Calscape. That depth of knowledge and the breadth of knowledge. And, um, and it's so approachable and so easy to use. He says no other state has the Calscape.org uh, site like it. No, there's nothing else like it. Yeah. You, yeah, that's awesome. I've heard that too. So that's a, an amazing resource that we can all take advantage of. Um, one other question that came up for me or something I thought of when you were talking is that I think that there's maybe a little bit of, um, blurring of the lines or misunderstanding with drought tolerant plants and native plants. I think what I find in when I meet with clients is a lot of people clump those two together, those two things together. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. That sort of goes along with the west coast of every continent having an area that's going to have a summer dry climate. So your last rain could be March and your first rain of the next year could be November. That is a really long stretch of time with absolutely no rain. So I grew up in LA, don't hate me for it, but that's where my parents were. And I went to Wellesley College, which is in Massachusetts, which has these rolling green hills. And I walked around and I was like kicking the ground. I was looking for the sprinklers. It never occurred to me that it rained in the summer and they don't sprinkle their lawn. Yeah. And that's what we're converting lawns to grassland, to bunch grasses, like John Muir described, um, that, um, that can get along with little or no water, no supplemental water, rather. Um, so Australian plants, um, African plants, there's a lot of plants that can tolerate the summer dry climate on the west coast of every single co uh, continent, except for maybe Antarctica. I don't know about them. Yeah. And to that point, and that was one of the filters when I started on this journey in my own garden was I was like, basically everything that doesn't look good right now, like everything that cannot survive a California <laughs> summer, you're out of here. Um, and that cleared up a ton of space, honestly. <laughs> Actually, I had that funny idea with the uh, Berkeley Rose Garden is like, leave the bottom row of roses, but all the other rows replace with plants indigenous and native to Berkeley and then don't give it supplemental water and don't give it fertilizer and don't give it all the fungicides for powdery mildew and see how those roses look after a year versus all the other plants. hundred percent. You pick the right plant and there's some real beauties. They're going to be happy. Yeah, I, I agree 
a hundred percent with that. I have a dear friend who has, um, several fruit trees and roses and converted his garden into natives and organics. And it took, I would say a season or two to really start seeing that biodiversity come back. So there is sort of a transition period, but it's a, it's a perfect system, you know, if, if sort of, if we don't mess it up a lot. And so bugs eat each other and birds and whatnot, and it works itself out. You have less disease, you have less pest problems. Um, so anyway, yeah, definitely like it. Um, is there a particular symbiotic plant that you know of that's good uh, around redwoods? Oh, okay. Um, so actually, um, the understory of a redwood forest, um, will be the, um, the Western sword fern and the other native ferns, um, the trillium, um, which actually takes seven years to flower from seed. Um, so don't pick a trillium for the wild, um, because they're so special and need to get propagated. Um, and, uh, the hazelnuts, um, which are edible, uh, Coriolis cornuus californica, have beautiful sort of chartreuse fuzzy leaves. So they sort of highlight in that understory um, where it's relatively dark. Um, so they look like there's a light shining on the plant. It's very cool. Um, so hazelnuts are an understory plant. And then all those ribes, R-I-B-E-S, ribes. Um, there's a lot of and they have beautiful flower displays um, and edible berries um, by the birds and probably edible to us, but we can leave them for the birds. Um, there's a Ribes viburnifolium that um, I've gotten from the uh, Nevada slope. So I think I took them all, sorry about that. Um, but they're evergreen, low growing ground cover that's great under trees and really a beautiful plant. Yeah, and also I would say that um, the poly polystichum to the the sword fern. I use that sword fern all the time, and I love that fern. Um, so that's a really lush look that I think can go under redwoods too. Yes, uh, this is a really good question. <clears throat> can you discuss watering newly planted natives? How much water in the first year or second year? Or how much water is needed? In you know, and when do you know it's established? Yeah. Um, so Greg Rubin, who wrote the book, California Native Landscape, um, he says you plant the plant, you keep the crown at the height of the, of the, of the earth around it. No supplemental uh, soil, no um, planting mix or anything like that. You have the indigenous soil all around it. And he says you put in a ton of water on day one. Not that it needs that much water, but it fills in all the little microscopic pores to get the soil and the roots in juxtaposition. So gallons and gallons and gallons of water on the day of planting. And then actually calscape.org does talk about a watering, um, but really most of the shrubs, it's every couple weeks, the first summer. Um, I had this oak seedling and I really wanted it to survive because it was in a perfect place. And I actually gave it some supplemental water and killed it. Um, so all my other oak seedlings, I haven't given any supplemental water to and they're all fine and happy. Um, so like the Fremontia, Fremontia, they don't like supplemental water at all. You give it some water and it's, um, it's rejecting, it's very bizarre. Um, but less than a weekly schedule um, for that first summer. And if they're, showing good growth and they look really well established, um, then you then just once a month during the next summer um, to kind of give it a more gardeny look, um, but you don't, and you don't need a lot of extra water. Um, so do you recommend, so I think somebody, I can't remember if it was you or somebody else, but, um, cause I, I did this in my garden when I planted, but uh, when you dig the hole that you fill it with water first and it let that sort of, seep in like you're saying okay exactly so that was in the marin um the marin water district published a book a couple of years ago water wise gardening or something like that mm -hmm. really really good information dig the hole fill it up with water let it drain out fill it up with water let it drain out and that's because the surrounding area you want to totally saturate with water so that when you plant your plant the surrounding area doesn't draw all the water away from it and it finally gets 
um, gets its little roots established and it isn't stressed at transplant. I mean, obviously transplanting, it's gonna be a stress, thing, uh, stress for the plant. So that's a really, really good suggestion. So. Yeah, and also now is really the best time to plant everything in, in natives in there too, because we can take advantage of the rains and that helps offset the water budget a bit and get them established and whatnot. The ground's still warm, so the roots are taking hold easier, but the air is cooler, so they transition. Yeah, all um, planting is the best. October, absolutely. November. Yeah. yeah. And you know, if you can throw down native seeds too. I, I, I think I threw out about seven pounds of seeds in my garden. <laughs> I, I'm not a big, like, I don't rely on seeds a lot. I'm not a big believer in seeds because I'm a lot more like instant. Um, so I figure if I just put a bunch in, something will grow. And if you're happy, like I'll, I have um, a stand of Clarkias. I just love Clarkias, big pink flowers. Yeah. And, um, they, um, when the seed matures and goes to a seed pod, that seed pod is like a little vertical vase. And you can take the dried plant and turn it upside down in a bucket and shake it like a salt shaker and collect the seeds. So you can actually get pounds and pounds and pounds of seeds and sort of augment your Clarkia drift if Clarkias are happy in your yard, um, which, is, which is really fun. And so you can have your own little niche of wildflowers um, that you uh, expand year by year. Poppies obviously are just the bomb. Yeah, that's my favorite flower. So a good chunk of that seven pounds is. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you use explosions. poppy seeds in your recipes, just like um, poppy, you know, to make poppy seed uh, lemon Poppins? cake and stuff like that. Oh, uh -huh. you're totally edible. The, the seed pods are smaller than the opium poppy or the you know, bread poppy, mm -hmm. um, but you can collect those seeds and use them in your recipes. Very cool. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, if you, one more quick question because we're almost at an hour, but uh, it's good and relevant, but if you could pick one or two plants that could possibly, that are native, that could replace lawn, do oh, you have sure. a couple that jump to mind? Yeah. So, um, there are 300 species of bunch grasses native to California, and they will tolerate foot traffic. And um, so the um, there's Elymas, E L Y M S, right. Um, right. So there's Elymas glaucus and Elymas bicatus. There's a bunch of Elymases, um, and there's uh, Deschampsia. There's a lot of bunch grasses, and you can. Um, look them up, um, get them in um, either by seed um, at a place called Labalisters in Santa Rosa has native plant seed mixes and or small um, four inch pots or even one gallon pots. And the native bunch grasses are not turf forming grasses. So they don't make the sideways stolon with the blade coming up that you mow a lawn. It would have a bunch and some ground and the bunch and some ground and that ground in the natural grassland would be room for perennials and annual wildflowers. So if you look at it, it's still solid green. You don't see dirt in between, but if you ply around with your hands, you'll actually see an individual bunch and a little extra space and an individual bunch and a little extra space. So that gives each plant extra water to collect from, extra room for water to collect from in the summer dry climate because the turf grasses are not um, largely from, you know, California. Um, so they're gonna be from an area that has a lot more summer water. So they're more adapted to here. And then yarrow, um, the yarrow can be used in between stepping stones. So that can tolerate foot traffic. Um, it can have, you can leave the flowers on the edges and then have them short, you know, where you're walking. But it's a really, really cute plant that can use, um, that can be a lawn substitute. But there's probably a section in the dance search for lawn substitute, but I can get a list. But the bunch grasses um, are, are key and there's a lot. Yeah, I mean, there, yeah. I mean, grass I, is my cell pulchra. So purple needle grass, that's a great tough grass. Mm -hmm. uh, we, I do, you can, you can get a native sod blend. So you can, 
you can get stuff in rolls like that. Are, that's like a carpet, like a traditional lawn that you uh, roll out. Um, and it's comprised of these bunch grasses, like Joan is talking about. Um, but that's, you know, if you want sort of that instant green, you know, blob or whatever, you can definitely get native sod blends either through, we can order them through slope or you can go directly to Delta bluegrass. That's where we get our native sod blends. Yeah. They're uh, a company. Yeah. I've been using those a lot, honestly, in design and it works good. You can keep it um, mode if you want more of a traditional look or you can let it go natural and it's a bit more of a meadow look, um, which is nice. So um, let me see, just making sure if we didn't, um, if we didn't address your questions, I'm trying to get through as many as possible. Feel free to email me and I'm happy to pass them on to Joan. I don't know if you uh, have your contact info available um, because we definitely wanna support this journey. And then also do look on our website under, it's under the learn tab and then garden videos. There's a ton of information. There's a Beyond Lawns class that was specifically about transforming your lawn. So we've taken deeper dives into various topics over the year. Um, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you'll, you know, you can also have access to all the videos and you'll get a notification when the video is posted. So this recording will be available on Tuesday both on our website and on our YouTube channel. And then we will have Joan's PowerPoint um, underneath the recording. So you can pause, rewind, screenshot, whatnot, um, go back and re review whatever you might've missed. Um, I, Joan, I really appreciate your time and your expertise. It's always such a joy to have you um, present for us. And I hope everybody has a nice Saturday. It's nice here. So I think I'm going to go out for a hike. Um, so anyway, enjoy and hope to see you at our next class next week. Thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you. Ciao.